All right, well, you know, uh, we'll just get started now. Um, my name's Gabe Hollenby. I'm a developer advocate here at Amazon Web Services. And in today's episode of Developers Let's Code, what we're going to do is talk about NoSQL data stores and you know, I'll cover an introduction to what they are, why you should care, and then we'll give a few examples of some of the popular NoSQL database options on AWS and how to get started using them. Uh, let's just dive right on in. We'll start with a. Uh, we'll start with this coverage of what is NoSQL, right? So, what do I mean when I say NoSQL? When I say NoSQL, uh, what I mean is what it says here on our helpful NoSQL uh, website, which I'll paste the link into the chat here. On our NoSQL page, we talk about high-performance non-relational databases with flexible data models. So, let me just quickly unpack that and describe what I mean, or what what do these terms mean? Okay, first and most important one is non-relational. So, what is non-relational? Non-relational means it's not, we're not joining tables together, right? So, uh, it, it's kind of in the name, right? No SQL, no SQL. So, SQL, Structured Query Language, uh, is the way that you may be most familiar with interacting with relational database management systems, right? Things like MySQL or PostgreSQL or SQL Server or uh, SQLite, right? Um, all these databases that have uh, that you query with Structured Query Language. And these follow a, a pattern that you probably learned when you were first learning about databases where you've got uh, tables, uh, and these tables all have a fixed schema. So every table says, okay, I have a bunch of rows in my table, and each row has the same columns. Uh, you know, for example, if we had a books table, then we would say uh, every item in my books table, uh, every row is going to have uh, an ID, and maybe an author, and a title, uh, and maybe a category. And while, you know, sometimes you can say if a, a column can be nullable or not, uh, for the most part, like, you're Every row has the same shape. Whether there's a data in a particular column or not, every row has the same shape. In NoSQL data stores, uh, most of the time you, you're, not, you're not bound by this restriction. So uh, your items generally don't need to have the same shape, even if they're in the same table. And that can be really uh, freeing, especially early on in your uh, development lifecycle when you're not really sure and your schema is still evolving. Uh, so that's one thing. You don't, you don't query them. Uh, sorry, they don't follow a uh, standard strong schema. Uh, necessarily, where they all have the same shape. Uh, two, non-relational, which also means there's no joining. Uh, you can't ask a relational data store to, to do a join. It, it, the, uh, a non-relational database like uh, DynamoDB, for example, which I'll spend a lot of time talking about in this, uh, in this episode. Hey, Alex, by the way, thanks for saying hi. Uh, so the, you don't do joins, right? If you want to get at data in a non in a NoSQL data store, typically you put everything you are going to need for that read use case, whatever that use case is, uh, on the same item. Uh, so the simplest way to think about it is it's, it's like a, most of these are going to be key value stores. I have a specific key for a record that I want all of the information about, and I'm going to use that key to, to get that information back out. Uh, which means, for example, instead of doing a join, let's see, you go with my books example. If we had books and they have an author ID and they have an author's table, in a traditional you know, database, a relational database with SQL, I would, you know, if I wanted to get the name of the author for a particular book that I had the ID for, I would select from books and I would join to authors, you know, where the book's author ID equals the author's ID. In a NoSQL option, uh, you would denormalize, that's the, the term we use from relational database modeling, and you would put all that data together if, if you thought you might need it. So if I knew that I might need to know the author when I'm showing a book in a NoSQL data store, I might just put all the author information along with that book. Now, you don't have to do it that way, and you could just do the join in application space, you know, make a request for the book, get back the author ID, make another request for the author, get that back. But a lot of the big gains you're going to have in NoSQL data stores come from thinking about them and modeling your data slightly differently, right? These days, disk space is relatively cheap, uh, and so you're better off writing the data the way that you know you're going to need to read it uh, and, and lean on that. Now, the last bit about this that's important uh, that I want to unpack is high performance. So we talked about flexible data models. We talked about non-relational. What do I mean by high performance? So high performance is this concept that like as you scale, you need to make your database needs to be able to scale with you. And NoSQL data stores are often much easier to scale because 
those joins aren't happening, right? It's, it makes it very clear and easy about how you're going to partition your data because you've got that one primary key and that's how you access that you know, particular item. So that'll make maybe more sense as we dive into some demos. Uh, if you're just joining me, again, my name is Gabe, and today's episode of Developers Let's Code, we're talking about NoSQL data stores on AWS. So I'm, I'm quickly just giving a background on what are NoSQL databases and why should you care, uh, and then uh, we'll dive into some demos. So let's move down here, and let's look at the why should you use a NoSQL database. So I've already covered part of this, right? Um, they're flexible, they're, uh, they're very scalable, they're high performance, and... Uh, they're also highly functional, right? So uh, the, the key is that generally the APIs that you use to talk to a, a NoSQL data store are going to fit the, the types of data that that database is, is meant to use. So what types of databases do we have? I'll quickly cover them all. Uh, we're just going to scan through this list. I'm not going to uh, dive in and give you examples in this episode on each of these, but let's quickly just do a survey on what the lay of the land is on the types of NoSQL databases that are out there and how they relate to what we have on Amazon Web Services. And then we'll dive deep and we'll look at a few of these specifically with code. So key value databases. Uh, this, as I mentioned before, gives you that this highly partitionable capability. Uh, and what that means is you can horizontally scale really easily. Now, uh, a key value, that's where, you know, you've got a key. I'm going to say I have a record. The record, I'm going to key it by ID. I'm going to write it with that ID to the data store. And anytime I want it back, I'm just going to ask for that ID. And you can put other indexes on maybe to, to support other data access patterns with other queries. But that's the basic concept is it's just a key value. Write, a value, write an item in with a key, get the item back by asking for that key. Um, there's no... Uh, there's limited support for doing things like where in, in, in key value data stores. Sometimes you can get away with it with data that you've told to store on disk in the same, uh, in a, in a same similar fashion. And I'll, I'll touch on that later with DynamoDB. But for the most part, you're just asking for one item at a time. Uh, DynamoDB is our uh, answer here. This is the thing you should look at for sure. Uh, if you're interested in key value data stores on AWS, and I'll spend a lot of time in today's episode digging into DynamoDB. Uh, why should you care about DynamoDB? Well, look at what it says here, right? I'm going to make that font bigger so you can see this. Um, it occurs to me, uh, I haven't been showing you my desktop, so forgive me for that. Uh, here, the uh, why should you care about DynamoDB? It's designed to provide single-digit millisecond latency for any scale uh, workloads. That's a huge benefit, right? No matter how many items you put into a DynamoDB table, you're going to get back single-digit millisecond responses for your queries. And that's, that's fantastic. A lot of data stores aren't going to slow down as they get more data in them. Uh, just moving on with our survey quickly, we've got document databases, and these are a little bit different. Uh, these often let you uh, do a bit more flexible querying uh, than uh, a key value store would. Um, the, the premier one in the field, the one that most of you may be familiar with, is one called MongoDB. And AWS has a data store called Amazon Document DB, uh, which provides Mongo database compatibility, MongoDB compatibility uh, over the wire. So it's, it's not MongoDB under the hood. It's a, a data store that uh, we've uh, created for high performance, but it speaks MongoDB uh, protocol uh, under the hood. And that's, that's what you use to communicate with it. Uh, we have graph databases. Um, so if you have data that you want to store in a relational graph, uh, relational data stores are actually, despite the name, really bad at storing graph-based data, right, where you have a bunch of nodes and you want to talk about how all these nodes connect because walking those nodes involves many, 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 many joins. So if you have that kind of data, you're better off using a data store that is built for, uh, uh, you know, walking that tree data structure, that graph data structure, uh, and also querying on it and filtering graph databases do that for you really well. We have one called Amazon Neptune. I'm not going to show you Neptune today because I want to focus on other things. Uh, when should you be using Aurora versus DynamoDB is a question from Xylent Hunter. Uh, good question. Uh, so I haven't talked about Amazon Aurora. I'll quickly contextualize this for you. So Amazon Aurora is a relational database system. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a NoSQL data store. Uh, and Amazon Aurora lets you uh, use the MySQL or Postgres uh, wire protocols to communicate with the data store. Uh, so you can think of it as MySQL or Postgres compatibility. Uh, but it's a custom-built data store from AWS meant for you know, really high performance in the relational world. So the easy answer is you should use Aurora, Amazon Aurora, if you have uh, relational database needs. 
you should use DynamoDB if you have if you want to use NoSQL database. Um, when might you want to use one versus the other with a specific use case? Well, uh, if you need to do a lot of ad hoc uh, query analysis, for example, so you know we talk about OLAP versus OLTP, uh, online analytical processing versus online transaction processing. So for analytical processing, you might say, you know, you know, if I have ad hoc queries, I don't necessarily know what the shape of my queries is going to be ahead of time. Then you're going to need something that's going to let you do joins and where clauses and you know aggregations and things like that on the fly. Uh, so a relational data store like Amazon Aurora, or depending on the size of your data, maybe even something more powerful with a columnar data store like Amazon Redshift for data warehousing could be a more appropriate choice. But if you have a need for a data store that needs to remain consistently fast and you, you're capable of knowing all of your data access patterns ahead of time, I would encourage you to look at something like Amazon DynamoDB uh, for that data store because you'll get single digit millisecond response times as your data grows. Uh, so you know, a, you know, a good example might be something like uh, storing uh, shopping cart information uh, for a really, really big e-commerce site, right? With millions of customers uh, using it at any given time. Uh, you, know, you need fast response times. Uh, you also need that to be globally scalable, uh, maybe even with replication around the world. Uh, DynamoDB can, can handle those cases really well. Hope that answers your question. Silent hunters, uh, let me know. Uh, and so just moving on with the final survey here, we've got two other types of NoSQL data stores in memory. Uh, so these are, you could think of them just like key value stores uh, that keep all their data in memory instead of sometimes writing or you know persisting data to disk. Really, really uh, useful for, ex for cases where you need even faster than single digit, mil single digit millisecond response times. So um, things like the session store for web servers. Uh, if you have a cluster of web servers and you need to store session state information because web servers are a stateless protocol, right? Or the HTTP is a stateless protocol. So if your web servers need to source session data somewhere and you have a fleet of web servers and you're never sure which, re which web server a particular request is going to go to, uh, or even if you did use something like sticky sessions to bind a user's session to a particular uh, instance of a server, uh, what if that server crashes? You don't want all that data to disappear. And so you will often in these cases use an in-memory data store uh, to, uh, to act as that sort of like distributed memory, if you were, uh, for uh, a cluster of computers. And a really popular use case, well, there's two, sorry, not use case, product. There's two really popular products here. Uh, one is called Memcached and one is called Redis. These are both uh, open source projects. Uh, and uh, we have a service called uh, Amazon Elasticache that offers Memcached and Redis uh, instances to serve these super low latency, high throughput workloads for you. Uh, we also um, have an ability to put a, a read and write through cache in front of DynamoDB called the DynamoDB Accelerator uh, that can give you, um, you know, microsecond response times as well if you need that and you're already using Dynamo. Uh, let's see, just checking on the chat here. If that memory is elastic, even better. Uh, so here, uh, the last example I want to just touch on for NoSQL data stores is Search. Um, a really popular case uh, of product is uh, Elasticsearch. You may have heard of that. We have a service that gives you a, a managed Elasticsearch cluster called Amazon Elasticsearch Service, as you can see here with this link. Uh, and that's purpose-built for giving you basically near real-time responses to ad hoc queries. Basically, you give it you know, JSON documents and, and it index, you tell it all the different ways you want it to index them and it builds lots of indexes and lets you query them against many different types of indexes. So really useful for ad hoc queries against uh, this sort of this document structured data as well. Um, so that covers the survey of all of the different types of uh, NoSQL data stores. Now I actually just want to dive in and, and show you some. So if you wanted to learn more, uh, which I, you know, I can't dive in and teach you all the details about how to think about data in a NoSQL way, but I'm going to show you some code now because this is a developer show. And we should get into the code. Um, but I just want to recommend uh, on this uh, aws to amazon.com slash NoSQL site, again, I'll just paste the, the URL here in the chat. Uh, there's some really great uh, run-throughs that kind of give you even more of a use case on when you should use relational, when you should use NoSQL. So, uh, Silent Hunter, again, to your question there about when should I use Aurora versus uh, NoSQL data stores like Amazon or like Dynamo. Uh, check that out. Just scroll down a bit more there. So um, with that said, I want to dive in and actually talk about DynamoDB. Uh, and then I'll spend some time 
Uh, depending on how we're going with the rest of the hour, we could talk about uh, Redis with some examples. We could look at Elastic Cache with Redis, or we could look at uh, uh, Document DB uh, with Mongo compatibility, and I could show that off. So uh, when we get there, I'll ask you guys to vote on which one you'd rather see. But I definitely want to spend time with DynamoDB, so let's look at that first. So um, DynamoDB, uh, what what is the... Uh, what is it and, and why should you care, right? So as it says here on the DynamoDB website, DynamoDB is a key value and document database that delivers single digit millisecond performance at any scale. Fully managed, multi-region, multi-master, durable database, built-in security, backup and restore, uh, and it can even do in-memory caching for internet scale applications. Uh, this is a nice boast, but it's true. DynamoDB can handle more than 10 trillion requests a day and can support peaks of more than 20 million requests per second. That's really big scale, uh, and DynamoDB can deliver there for you. So let's look at it. Uh, let's actually just crack it in and, and see how you get started and, and write some code to talk to DynamoDB now. So I've already logged into my AWS management console here. I'll just bump up the font for you. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll just go and we'll say, well, hang on, let me pick a region first. I'm in Singapore. Oh, good. That seems fine. So let's look at DynamoDB. I'll go to the DynamoDB console and... If I want to create a table, I can click Create Table. And when I create a table, I can choose you know, how uh, uh, I have to choose some attributes about uh, what that table is, is going to support. And what I mean is, you have to give it a name. So I have to, let's, let's just call it, for example, um, let's call it uh, Books. Um, books one, and I'm gonna call it books one because later we're gonna do a different table called books with some other code. So I, I don't want it to, uh, to, to conflict. So with this table, eh, maybe we'll call it books DLC for developers, let's code. Uh, I need to give it a primary key. So this is the way I'm going to read and write data from this table, right? What's the key going to be? Uh, so we'll have the books uh, ID, we'll just give it, a, every book has a, a unique ID which I'll call, uh, I can make it a string, a binary, or a number data type. I'll go with string. And now I could also do this thing where I can add a sort key. And if I do that, maybe uh, I'll have um, title be a sort key. So this means I can just pass an ID and then I'll, I can get back all of, I can easily scan because DynamoDB will keep all of the books uh, on, uh, on disk sorted by title. Uh, or maybe author might be better. I think author would be better than title for this. Uh, so uh, actually, why don't we do this? Let's make author the primary key and let's make title the sort key. This is nice because then if I know an author's name, uh, I can I can uh, get all the books for that author. So if you add a sort key, you don't have to, but if you add a sort key, it'll keep all those records uh, sorted on disk for you. And that lets you do range queries and things like that. So we can check that out too. Um, for the table settings, I'm gonna uncheck the use default settings box. Uh, and, oh good, thanks for following along, Alex, let's roll. So uncheck default settings. Uh, I'm gonna leave secondary indexes alone right now, but I do wanna check some other things here. So I wanna call your attention to one of my favorite features of DynamoDB, which is the setting here on read write capacity mode. So you have two choices, provisioned or on demand. I strongly recommend you use on-demand for all of your tables when you're first getting started, unless you know specifically that you're going to have a consistent amount of read and write usage, in which case you can provision a certain amount of read and writes per second ahead of time. Uh, but the, the TLDR is use on-demand when then it's truly serverless. You're only, you're, you will pay a small amount for whatever data you store in DynamoDB, but uh, mostly you're not gonna be paying for provisioned resources in terms of queryability that you aren't using. With on-demand, uh, you'll pay per query, per read or per write operation. So if you're not querying it, you're gonna have much less cost. If you use provisioned and then you just like leave your application alone and it's, not, it's never talking to your tables, then it's gonna cost you more per month. So I strongly recommend using on-demand. It's one of my favorite features. Uh, so we'll leave it on demand. Uh, and then uh, DynamoDB encrypts your data at rest. Uh, you can just leave the default option, which will encrypt it with a key that uh, Amazon DynamoDB manages for you. Uh, that's the simplest way and there's no additional cost for that. So finally, I'll just click create. You could add tags if you wanted to, but I'll just click create. I'm not gonna tag this resource. And you can see here in a minute, uh, so it says here tables being created. You can see I've got some other tables here in DynamoDB already created, uh, but 
in just a minute, this will change from tables being created to you know tables available, and then we can go ahead and start querying on it. There we go. It's available now. Uh, we can go here to this items uh, tab here in the console, and uh, you can see that here. I'll just make this bigger. You can see that there's no items here right now. So let's just add one. So we can use the GUI even to, to read and write. Now, obviously, we're going to get to this with code too. But uh, before we do it with code, I like to show it to you in the console here so your the concepts map a little bit easier. So if you want to create an item in DynamoDB just using the console, you can click that Create Item button in your table and give it uh, you know the values that we need. So an author and a title uh, and anything else we want. So for example, uh, I'm just going to stick with author and title right now, and we'll add other attributes later. So author, uh, who's an author I like? Uh, Neil Gaiman. Uh, and we'll give a title called Sandman. And we'll click Save. And then I can make another one. And I'll make another Neil Gaiman. And, and I could have put space, strings with spaces here instead, but I'm just, you know, they're just arbitrary strings. I'm using underscores. Uh, we'll put another title here called uh, American Gods. And let's just make one more item here. Uh, we'll call it another, some other author. Hey, chat, give me an author. Who's uh, a famous author that you all know and uh, would like me to use in the demo? Give me a name. Let's see. I'll put an author in while I'm waiting for you all, and you can give me one. Arthur Conan Doyle. I like that. Thanks, Tapka Wild. Let's go with an oh, Gabe Hollenby. Yes, I write blog posts. Um, let's go with uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. I like that. And he wrote a lot of Sherlock Holmes books. I don't remember the titles of them, but for this, we'll just call it Sherlock Holmes uh, Volume 1. Uh, cool. So we'll save that. Uh, Terry Pratchett, another good choice. Uh, I love it. I'm, I'm among friends here in chat. I always like that. So uh, let's just, oh, fine. We'll do one more. We'll add Pratchett. Terry Pratchett. Did I spell it right? P-R-A-T-C-H-E-T-T. -T. Yep. Okay. Uh, and he wrote a lot of fun books. Uh, Nightwatch, I think, is Terry Pratchett. Maybe I'm right about that. I think so. The Nightwatch. Uh, so we'll say save. Okay. So we've got some things in our, in our data store now. How do we query them? Uh, well, we can query them a lot of ways. So uh, instead of doing a scan, let's go to query. Table scans as, are just the same as in... Uh, in uh, in relational data store land, right? You don't want to do scans. You can. You can just say, I want to scan everything in the table and maybe I want to filter uh, before I get the results back on a particular field. But most of the time you should be using queries. So let's query and let's search for, and you'll see here, it's asking me for a partition key and a sort key. So I could say, I would like to know all of the Neil Gaiman books that I have. Uh, and if I click search for that, um, Hang on one second. Um, ah, I was wondering why I only got one back. It's because I have a typo. In this Neil Gaiman, I called it Nail Gaiman. So that's wrong. So let's just look at how we edit uh, records real quick. You can just click on them here in the console uh, and you can go in and, uh, and edit them there. So yeah, look at that. Uh, oh yes, you cannot modify the unique keys of the item. You have to copy. So that's a, that's a good learning. I forgot about that. So uh, author is part of the primary key. You can't edit the primary key. You have to insert a new one instead. Uh, so uh, we can say duplicate, but we can change this to Neil. And then we'll get rid of Nail Gaiman because he's wrong. We That was a typo. Cool. So now if I go back and I query, I can say, give me all the Neil Gaimans and I can get them back right? But because it's sorted uh, by sort key, and you can even see the results come back sorted by title, uh, I can do range queries too. Now, I only have two records here for Neil Gaiman. Um, so uh, this won't be super interesting, but you can use your imaginations. So I could just say even, imagine if we had more, I could say, give me all the Neil Gaiman books that begin with, you know, A, and I'll only get back American Gods, right? Or if I, if I picked, uh, uh, what was the other Neil Gaiman book I put? Sandman. I could say begins with S and I can get that back. Or I can say X and get nothing back. So in a nutshell, that's the basics of DynamoDB. You get and you, and you query uh, and you can even update items too. But let's, let's do it with code. Let's not just do it with a console here. Yeah, nothing better than troubleshooting, doing it live. That's what it's all about. Uh, I always like it when you can see a bit of troubleshooting in live streams because that's, uh, that's how you learn. That's how you know it's authentic. And that's how, uh, 
you can, it's really useful to see how people who are familiar with technology troubleshoot the same types of problems that you're going to run into yourself probably when you're learning. So let's switch in and let's actually do some code. So um, I have some notes here that I just want to bring up on my other screen and, and point you to a really nice uh, tutorial that I'm going to reference now. So let me get that in the chat for you. So here's this. Create and manage a non-relational database. It's one of our getting started guides and it's a great introduction to DynamoDB. Now it happens to use Python. Uh, I'll just quickly call out that if you're not into Python, there you, know, you can talk to Amazon DynamoDB in the uh, SDK of your choice. AWS has a lot of different programming language SDKs that let you know talk to AWS in whatever language, JavaScript, uh, C Sharp, Ruby, uh, Python, uh, Java. Th there's a lot. Um, so don't let it don't let it put you down if you're not into Python. But even if you're not a Python developer, you should be able to follow along with the code samples because they're pretty easy to understand. Although the the different APIs may look a little bit different depending on what language you're using and what SDK that is. So uh, you can check here. There's a, a section here that talks about the application background. Basically, this is going to give us a simple use case where we're going to talk about uh, managing books. And so uh, there's uh, a section here around creating an AWS account, and then it gets into setting up a Cloud9 IDE. Uh, I'll quickly just mention Cloud. You don't have to do this, but I recommend it. Uh, Cloud9 is a cloud-native uh, integrated development environment that you can use on AWS. What's useful about it is it'll set up the, the credentials you need to talk to AWS services, uh, and it gives you a, basically an EC2 instance in the cloud that you can SSH into and edit the files in, all within your web browser. So it just certainly makes it easy when you're just noodling around and trying to get learning on things. Uh, so that's why the Getting Started Guide recommends it. Um, I've already done that, so I'll go to a Cloud9 IDE that I've already set up. Uh, and then it talks about getting some supporting code here, which I've also already done. So let's just switch to that so you can see uh, what I've got here. So we'll go to Cloud9. in a new tab, and here we are. I've got a, a instance already created called DLC NoSQL. So let's open that up. And the cool thing about Cloud9 is it puts your environment to sleep when you're not using it. Uh, so it's uh, gonna resume the EC2 instance that's backing this right now. That's the virtual machine in the cloud on Elastic Compute Cloud, uh, our service that lets you provision virtual machines. Can you give more use cases for DocumentDB versus DynamoDB? Bluebees, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for, for asking. So while we're waiting for this to spin up, let me tell you. My recommendation is, if you are a MongoDB fan today, and you're either already using MongoDB in a project, but it's you know not on AWS, uh, or you're managing it yourself on AWS, um, or you really you know for sure that MongoDB is a great fit for you, then I recommend using uh, the DocumentDB. Uh, because it'll speak Mongo and you'll be happy. If you're just getting started with a project and you're like, mm, I think I want to use NoSQL Data Store, but I'm not sure which one I want to use right now, I would actually encourage you to, to use DynamoDB uh, instead. And there's some really awesome features that I don't have time to get into right now with Dynamo, uh, but I'll just quickly call them out for you. So uh, you, you can turn on global table replication uh, with one button, uh, one button click. There's point in time recovery. So with DynamoDB, if you, you make a mistake or something goes wrong, you can roll back to a specific point in time uh, for your database. It does automatic database backups as well. Uh, you're going to get that single digit millisecond latency. Uh, it's full, it has this fully managed, uh, you know, totally uh, serverless option with the on-demand queryability. So your costs will be really low if you, if you have a spiky workloads or you know, you're not often querying that table. Uh, so I really, really recommend Dynamo if you don't have a strong opinion already where you say I need to use a Mongo uh, database. Hope that answers your question. All right, Stephen King, nice author as well. Uh, also one of my favorites. The Dark Tower series is excellent. So here I have my Cloud9 environment open, and now we can follow along with the rest of this tutorial. Uh, so I've already downloaded the uh, DynamoDB example code that they have here. And let me quickly just check my... Uh, my tables, cool. Uh, I think we're going to be good here. I don't think I'm going to run into a naming conflict. So let's start with inserting and retrieving data, and let's see what this looks like in code. Um, so it'll walk you through some of the stuff I've already kind of told you about, about what the terminologies are for tables and items. Attributes are this concept that right, the items can have more than just the, the primary key and the sort key, like you saw me do in the console. They can have anything they want, and I'll show you that in code in a minute. So the data model that they want us to talk about is books are going to have titles and authors, 
and they'll have a category uh, like history or biography. And then they'll have a different data type called a map. So this is a DynamoDB specific data type that you can think of just like a, a Python dictionary or a JavaScript object that has keys and values. Uh, and that'll be the different formats that we have available for sale, like hardcover or paperback, and what that particular SKU uh, or item number is for that version of the of the of that format of the book, if that makes sense. So when you see the code in a minute, uh, hopefully that'll make sense to you. So let's actually do it. So the way this, this getting started guide works is that uh, once you download the, uh, the files, you'll get uh, a bunch of files that look like this. And so the first thing you'll need to do is create a table. And let me just bump up my font size so hopefully you can read this better. Um, looking at this create table Python file, this is just showing you how to create a table programmatically if you didn't want to do it in the console. You could also create it you know, with uh, infrastructure as code tools like CloudFormation or Terraform uh, or the Cloud Development Kit, the CDK. Uh, but you can do it, of course, using the, uh, using the, uh, the SDK. And for Python, that SDK for AWS is called Boto3. So here we're going to make a DynamoDB client uh, and we're going to use the US East 1 region. Let's change this. Let's, well, I'm going to have to change it everywhere if I do this. Well, that's okay. Uh, AP Southeast 1, which is Singapore. So remind me, if I, if I have to troubleshoot something, we're doing these things in Singapore instead of US East 1. Uh, so AP Southeast 1 is a Singapore region. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we're going to do is create a table called Books. And as you can see, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to try and remember to mute my mic when I'm coughing. I'm just getting over a cold here, so I have a bit of a tickle in my throat. Anyway, what you can see here is we've got uh, authors and titles, and these are going to be uh, key type hash and range is how we say this is the primary key, this is the sort key. And then we have to say what data type those are. So we'll say author is a string and title is also a string. And then we can say you know, how we want to provision this, this table for... Uh, if you wanted to give it um, provision throughput, not the on-demand mode, then you would have code that looks like this, where you give it read and write capacity units. But if you don't want to do that, and if you like me, you want it to be the on-demand mode, uh, instead you can just say billing mode equals paper request. So let's run this and let's see what happens. Ah, uh, table already exists, books. Oh, do I already have a books table in uh, the Singapore region? Did I save this file? Ah, I didn't save. So I didn't save this file, and so it tried to uh, run this in US East 1, where I already do have a table called books. Let's try this again. Table created successfully. <coughs> yep. Thanks, Alex Masha. So... Uh, Table's done. It's created successfully. Let's move on and let's see how we can uh, insert some data into the table. So before we can get items, we have to insert some. So here again, uh, AP Southeast 1 for the region. Uh, we're going to get a handle on a table, uh, a particular table called books. And then we're going to use the batch writer uh, interface in the Python SDK, which will let me put a bunch of items. So this is going to put in uh, some items, some John Grisham books, uh, some James Patterson books, a Dr. Seuss book, and a William Shakespeare book. So let's just run that, and then we'll actually look and see what that looks like. Uh, so this is, oops, sorry, not create table, insert items. All right, so we've inserted some items. Are they there? Well, we could just look at the console and see. So let's go back to the console, and let's, uh, let's refresh so we can see our, uh, our new books table. And there, there, there they are, right? As you can see, we've got uh, all those records in. And so this is what that map data structure looks like that I told you about. Behind the scenes, how Python stores it is it knows, okay, I've got these, uh, these keys, and then this is the data type inside that key. These are all strings. So audiobook has a product ID of blah, blah, blah. This audiobook for Along Came a Spider has this ID. Also looks like we have a hardcover copy of this, et cetera. So there's our, uh, there's our items in. Let's do something more though. Uh, let's go ahead and the, sorry, let's move on to the next step where we're querying and, and talking about global secondary indexes. So uh, we've inserted data. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't retrieved them with code yet. So there's, uh, we can get a particular item. So if we want one item, we can do it like this. With one item, we can get a particular item. And so uh, because we have a primary key and a sort key of author and title, we have to specify both to get a particular item out. 
So I can get back John Grisham's The Rainmaker by just asking for get item with that with that key comprised of the author and title. It's like a composite key. And let's see what that looks like if we get back a response. So I will run get item. And there we've got it back and it looks like a Python dictionary as you can see uh, in uh, in uh, in Python when I write it back out. So uh, the Python SDK is doing that translation step of uh, converting the data types back from what DynamoDB said was a string, so it knew to give it me back to it as a string there instead. Uh, but what if we want multiple items, right? So this is actually a really a great point. Uh, what if we want to query on something other than just the, uh, or I want to get back uh, all the books by category. That's a good way to put it, right? We only have the ability right now to get items if I give it a title uh, and an author. I can't actually ask for everything by particular category yet. I could scan, but that'd be inefficient. So instead, uh, as this tutorial will tell you, we can create what's called a global secondary index, which will let DynamoDB in that table store another index where indexed by whatever we specify and let us uh, you know, read data back out by whatever we're gonna key on in that index. So uh, let's take a look. First, uh, we can look at query items. So. Uh, here's, here's the one thing we can do. This is the first case where we haven't made the index yet. So what I'm gonna do here is show you AP Southeast one. Let's just update this. Uh, here I can query and I can say that you saw me do this at the console before. Uh, I can query by anything that I already have an index for. So there's already I'm indexed by author. Uh, so I can say, give me everything by John Grisham. That was my primary key, right? So if you wanna just see what this looks like first, I can query items and I can get back all the John Grisham books. And that's great, but as I said, what if we want to uh, query by and give me back all the books that have a particular category like suspense? We're gonna need uh, a new index for that. So that's what this tutorial will walk you through next, which is uh, how to create a secondary index. So let's just look at that in the code. Add secondary index. So Here, we're gonna say, and this is just how the, the different parameters you have to specify. And by the way, I should say, you don't need to just like find example code uh, in order to know how to talk to DynamoDB. Um, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the user guides, uh, you know, AWS, DynamoDB, uh, developer guide. Uh, I definitely recommend reading the developer guide documentation, which I'll paste in the chat for you so you have an easy reference to it. Um, the developer guide is extremely useful. It tells you about all the concepts, all the different API calls you can make. And after you've read the DynamoDB uh, developer guide, then uh, it would make sense to uh, then it would make sense to learn about the SDK interface for whatever language you're using. For example, uh, DynamoDB Python SDK. And then we can learn about the uh, the Python SDK specifically for DynamoDB, which you can see we have a whole section about here that teaches you about it. Uh, so that's how you know, for example, what parameters to pass in here. Just checking the chat, uh, what are the limitations of using secondary indexes? Uh, there is a maximum number of secondary indexes you can have on a table, so that's important to know, uh, but there are clever ways uh, to structure your table so that uh, th that probably won't be an issue for you. Um, I don't have time to dig into this now, uh, but I will say, um, Rick Houlihan, H-O-U-I-L-A, Han, DynamoDB. Let me see if I can just find this for you. There we go. Um, there's a really nice uh, community guide to DynamoDB that lives at dynamodbguide.com. And in here, uh, one of the people I definitely want to recommend you uh, you look at is uh, talks by Rick Houlihan. He's an amazing speaker, uh, and in this uh, additional reading section, uh, you'll find some uh, some posts about uh, understanding the single table design with DynamoDB, which lets you do many different use cases with one table, which is actually optimal, but it requires you to think about your problems at a, a totally differently. Uh, so I can't dig into it now, but you should read more there. Built my DB is what I mean. Uh, sorry, taking a look at the questions. Um, imagine I forget to use it secondary next when I initially built it. Can I go back and change? Yes, Alex. So actually that's what just happened here. What I'm showing you today is exactly that. So we created a, a table. We didn't have a secondary index. Now I'm going to add one after data already exists in the index. I'm gonna go, oh, 
uh, sorry, already exists in the table. I'm saying, oh, right. I have a new, I discovered a new query mode I need to handle, which is I want to uh, be able to query books by category. Uh, so I'm going to create a global secondary index on category. Uh, and if I do that, and again, I'm just going to use the API for it. We could also do it in the console. So, you know, I could also go here to the, uh, to the indexes tab, and I could just follow the, the GUI here to create an index if I want. And that's exactly what the, uh, the it's going to functionally do the same thing as what the, uh, the, the Python code here is, is doing. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, now this is going to take a minute or two to actually create the index. Uh, I'll refresh here so you can see that it'll, it'll go from status creating uh, to status available after it's done. In my last test, it took about three minutes. So uh, I'll look to see if I can answer some questions here about this. Uh, and we can even look at the other Python code for talking to Dynamo while we're waiting for this. Uh, but I want to look at the questions in chat. Held a message for a reason. Um, okay. Would you use DynamoDB for high volume, like say a login system, or would that go to DocumentDB? Is DynamoDB good for high transactions? What workload would not be good for DynamoDB? Okay, 100% I would use DynamoDB for high volume. As I said, the you're gonna get really fast response times uh, with DynamoDB. Uh, you can it can handle trillions of requests. Uh, I mean, millions of requests per second, even, uh, and and not break a sweat. So, yes, DynamoDB is good for high transactions. Uh, for that, that is exactly you know what it's divine, designed for. Uh, so, what workloads are not good for DynamoDB? Again, if you don't know your access patterns and you cannot think about them and and for certain know your access patterns ahead of time, then DynamoDB is not the right data store for you. But there's no reason why you can't keep your data uh, in different databases simultaneously for to support different cases. For example, this is a feature I haven't mentioned yet in Dynamo, but it's smart. Um, there's the capability of uh, creating triggers. Uh, now I'm zoomed in so much you can't see the tab here. You can create triggers in Dynamo that will evoke an AWS Lambda function, uh, which is you know a, a serverless function there. You just you write the code and we handle uh, executing that function for you. So you can create these triggers that trigger a Lambda function whenever anything in your DynamoDB table changes. And then that could, for example, you know stream the record also to uh, another data store uh, to support your analytical queries as well. So you can do both, right? You have it, maybe DynamoDB is your transactional system of record, and then you also stream the data off uh, to uh, in a, in a relational database like uh, with Amazon Aurora or even a data warehouse like Amazon Redshift, for example, um, to support what other querying capabilities you need uh, so you can have the best of both worlds. Uh, yeah, you could use it like a login system. Um, I did share a link to the DDB community uh, up ahead. If you just look, the dynamodbguide.com uh, is the link there, Jay Tanton. Um, oh, yeah, and there's more community content there. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so... Let's just see how my uh, my index is going. It's probably not. Oh, it is. It's active already. Perfect. So now we can go on and we can see how it looks to to use that index that we've created after we already put data in the table, right? And that's why we had to wait for the index to become live. So now uh, we can actually query with the index. So this is pretty nice. Um, changing the region. Um, First thing it's going to do is make sure the index is available. Normally, you, you probably wouldn't need to do this in your code, but this is the getting started guide, and it knows if you ran this right away without the index being ready, then uh, you know, we don't want you to have an, un, an unfriendly error message. So this example code says, I know the index might take some time to become active, so I will wait for that first. Uh, but basically, this is the, the thing we're, we're interested in. We're going to say, from my uh, books table, I want to query using the category index that I made uh, where the category happens to equal suspense. So let's see what that looks like. Hopefully we'll get back only the uh, query with, we only get back the suspense items. And we do, all right? So we've got the firm, we've got the Rainmaker, and along came a spider. So those are all our suspense books, you know, despite what author they're from. So that was nice, and that was a good, fast response. And it would stay fast because we had an index around that. Um, why is Mickey, can you tell me what link is dead so I can help give you the, the link again? Now, uh, the last thing I want to show you is updating an item. Uh, so what does it look like? Pretend we need to update an item in code. Um, how can we do that? So here's a nice thing. We'll, we'll get an item. We'll get John Grisham's The Rainmaker, and then we'll print it out. And then we'll go and we'll try and update the item where we'll say 
Uh, now, this is this is part that I just want to kind of walk you through because it could look a little unfamiliar to you. The community content link I posted was 404ing. Um, let me post it again. Dynamo. DB guide. I have somebody spelled DB right. Okay, let's try that. There you go. So uh, the last thing I just want to show you to make you familiar with it, because the first time you see this, you might be like, whoa, this is weird. Let's look at how the you should write your updates uh, to your items. So you'll notice here I have this thing called an update expression. Um, in the in the API, uh, in the SDK, one thing I'm going to pass is this update expression. And it says set formats.audiobook to ID. But it's got these funny symbols, hashes and colons. What's going on here? Well, the idea is uh, there are some reserved words in Dynamo and uh, we want to make sure that it, you know, we know how to parse what your update should be. So you write your expressions and you escape the attribute names and you escape the attribute values. And those will get templated in uh, when the query runs. And so in order for that to work, you need to specify what the attribute names actually are, and you're going to give them these unique keys here, and what the attribute values are and what unique keys you want to use there for the query, and it slots those values in. And the, the convention is use hash for your uh, attribute names and use uh, colon for your values. You don't have to follow that convention, but it's, it's sort of the convention that people tend to use. Um, the other thing that is, we're, we're actually, if you notice, we're doing a deep set. Remember this format uh, type here in our items is a, a map type. And so we know that there's an audiobook, or sorry, we know that formats has values like, uh, is it uh, uh, hardcover, paperback, etc. So we're going to set inside for the formats map for the Rainmaker, we're going to give it a new value for audiobook. It didn't have audiobook yet. Uh, and we're going to add one in. So you can even do these deep sets or deep gets from the maps as well. Uh, so let's just run this so we can see what the results are. I'll make this bigger so you can see this a little bit nicer too. Ah, uh, here's a question while uh, I'm just waiting. Um, let's try this again. Um, question is, for every set of search criteria we use for a table, we need to create a secondary index and make that field the partition key. Um, no, uh, the way it's going to work is, hang on one second. I'm just going to cancel this. I don't know why my update item isn't working. Uh, something's timing out here. Did I put the right? Nope. <laughs> my region name has a typo in it. So it's not AP South Southeast one. It's just AP Southeast one. Let's try that again. So it was timing out trying to talk to a region that doesn't exist. I'll just run that so we can get that result here. So quickly, before I get to your question, let me just close this off. As you can see, uh, let me make the font bigger. Looks like I can't. Maybe I'll just zoom a bit more. So as you can see beforehand, there's only hardcover and paperback formats. But then after our update, we added an audiobook format, and that worked just fine. So that's nice. We can do updates even deep inside a map. So your question, Flux Quantum, is a great question. For every set of search criteria we use for a table, do we need to create a secondary index and make that field the partition key? Um, you... Yes and no. So you should think about all the different ways that you need to query your, that you're going to need to get at your data. And then uh, what you'll do is create indexes to support those queries, uh, but you might need to overload an index. Uh, and so this is this concept that I, I told you is a little bit too deep for me to get into in this stream. But um, the idea is instead of uh, having always one type of uh, one type of data in your stream uh, in your table uh, in a particular column you can have multiple types of data in that column uh, so that if you do hit your your index limit where you can only have a, a certain number of global secondary indexes uh, you wouldn't hit that limit if you overloaded an index by different types uh, I hope that makes sense even if it doesn't if you just think about uh, if you search for you know DynamoDB uh, index overloading or single table design, you'll find the resources that'll explain that a bit better. Hey, AWS John, thanks for uh, joining the stream. Uh, so that wraps up my thing about Dynamo. I've got 10 minutes left. I was thinking uh, I could quickly show you uh, how to get started with uh, Redis uh, with Elastic Cache. Uh, 
that I think that might be fun for the stream. Or, or we could quickly look at document DB uh, with, uh, with Mongo compatibility, if that seems more interesting. So in the 10 minutes we have left, uh, I'll put it to the, to the stream. Uh, would, would you all like to see me uh, open uh, Redis with ElastiCache or uh, document DB and, and just quickly talk to that? Give, give me some votes here, chat. What would you like to see? Or we can, you know, it's your stream if you want. We can just talk about Dynamo for 10 more minutes. So give me the votes. So document DB, Redis, or Dynamo, more Dynamo. Those are your, those are your uh, options. Okay, couple, we've got two votes for Redis so far, one vote for document DB. Any more? Okay, Redis is looking like, yep, Redis is a clear winner. Okay, we're going to talk about Redis in 10, for 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm not going to explain a lot of what Redis is or why it's awesome. Hopefully you all know. If you don't, uh, the TLDR, it's a really popular open source in-memory key value data store that can do some great things. Very common for uh, doing things like session state management uh, for your web servers. Let's just quickly look at that. So uh, back in the console, I'm going to go to ElastiCache and I'll create a new one. ElastiCache is what I'm going to talk about for Redis. Uh, so ElastiCache is the name of our service that lets you create um, Memcached or Redis uh, servers on AWS. So uh, I've already created one here, which I'll probably actually use for the demo, but let, let me show you how to create a new one. So you go to create in the console and you pick your cluster engine. I'm going to pick Redis. Uh, for this demo, I'm not going to turn on cluster mode. Uh, I'm just going to make a single instance, so I won't even be high availability, but it's important to note you can do that. This is going to live in the Amazon cloud. This is not an on-premise instance uh, that I need to work with. So I have to give it a name. So I'll call it DLC Live uh, Redis. And this is my DLC Live demo. And I'll leave all the defaults uh, there. You know, Redis 6.x. I'm going to change the node type instead of it being... Uh, a pretty powerful 13 you know, gigabyte instance. I'm gonna go for a very small one just for the purpose of this demo. I'm gonna make it a T3 micro with only half a gig of RAM because uh, that's a lot more affordable and I don't need a big beefy one for my demo. Uh, lastly, I'm not, so if I want multi availability zones, so it's highly available in case we have a problem with one AZ, uh, I could leave this number of replicas at greater than one and take the multi AZ box. I'm gonna turn that off for the sake of the demo because I don't need high AZ for high availability for a demo. Uh, and then uh, I have to pick some additional settings uh, about like what subnet groups I want to deploy to in the VPC. Uh, basically, I have a subnet group that ticked all my availability zones uh, in a particular VPC. I don't care what uh, zone it places this, this instance is in. I've got a default security group here, uh, the default one that comes with my VPC. Uh, I'm going to add another one to this. Uh, so I have one called DLC Rehearsal Redis. Instead of creating a new security group, I'll just use this one. I'll show you why in a minute. But basically, I want to be able to talk to my Redis instance from some other EC2 instance running inside the same virtual private cloud or VPC. Uh, and luckily, my Cloud9 instance is already in the same uh, in the same VPC. And so this security group, which we can look at in a second, just has a rule that says, allow ingress traffic on Redis' port from my Cloud9 instance to the Redis. Uh, if I want, I can turn on encryption at rest. Again, we can leave it to use the default AWS managed key. Uh, pro tip, uh, you think, oh, why not turn on encryption in transit too? Um, you can, but it's a lot more complicated uh, and I'm not gonna do it for this demo because you have to tunnel your traffic uh, from Linux instances using S-Tunnel. Uh, it's more than I can get into in this stream. So I'm gonna leave off encryption in transit. Not really a concern for me anyway because this instance is gonna live in my private subnet of my VPC uh, that only my other uh, you know, instances in the private subnet can talk to. So I'm happy to just leave encryption at rest turned on, but not the in transit stuff. The rest of these settings I'll leave at, as they are and I'll just click create. What if it goes down during the demo of Foxy? Yes, it could. Uh, hopefully it won't. Uh, so this can take a minute or two to create. And since I've only got about seven minutes left in the stream, I'm going to go ahead and switch to using this one I already baked in the oven earlier. Uh, but it's a, I did exactly the same setup as I did for this one that you just saw. So once it's live, what you'll see, if you look at it, is uh, a bunch of data here. The thing I'm most interested in is getting this DLC rehearsal, uh, I'm sorry, getting this primary endpoint value out. In this case, it's called this. So I'm going to copy that, and then uh, I'm going to go back to my Cloud9 instance, and I'm going to switch to some other code that I already pre-wrote. Actually, I didn't write this. I should I should call that out for you. Um, there's a really nice uh, a, a tutorial about using ElastiCache. Uh, so let me 
Let me just copy this into the chat for you too. So uh, I'm going to be using uh, code samples from this other getting started tutorial, uh, building fast session caching for Amazon Elastic Cache with Redis. So let's just quickly see what that looks like. Um, that's inside the session store examples. And what I want to show you is, let me close these other tabs. Um, what I want to show you is we're going to take really quickly, we're going to do one thing. We're going to take a simple Python Flask app. If you don't know Python uh, or Flask, this is just going to make me a simple web server that routes uh, three different types of requests, slash, slash login, and slash logout. Uh, and I'm just going to start it and explain it while it's running because it'll make sense to you all. Um, Amazon Elastic Cache samples, and then session store, and then... I want to run Flask, but I want to just change some of these settings. First, I'm not going to talk to Redis, so I'll leave this Redis part out of the environment variables. We're going to run example one that we just looked at. And okay, that's the command I need to use to run Flask. Uh, don't let that bother you. It's not super important to this. We just want to see how we talk to Redis from code. So um, what I have here on my instance now is a, uh, a web server that's running. I'll pop this out to a new window. So you can see it says logged in as Gabe. I can say log out. Okay, so I'm not logged in, right? And I can go to login and I have a form and I can type anything I want. So I'll type John. And then it says logged in as John, right? And so this is just managing my session state for this simple web app uh, in directly inside Python in the Python processes memory for Flask. There's nothing you're talking about Redis. This is just Flask in the Python process memory. But what if we had a whole cluster of servers and we wanted session state management? Uh, and you know that suddenly then what we want is, uh, we don't want to man manage that in memory in the web servers. We want that living somewhere else. Redis is a super popular use case for that. So instead, let's just uh, add a, uh, let's add a version that talks to Redis. So here we'll also just bring in Redis from Python, for example, uh, and we'll get the Redis URL from a new environment variable file. And then here is a session store class that tells Flask uh, how to read and write session data if, you're, if we're gonna use something other than the Flask in memory session. Uh, and what we're gonna do here uh, is uh, create a Redis in client instance from whatever URL is inside of our environment variable. And then here we're using the Redis H set and get set, which sets a key and sets a value uh, based on that. So if you don't know Redis, don't let this put you off. I'm just, it, this is code that will very easily read and write data from Redis uh, in Python. Uh, and the example code's here for you to dig into later as I already shared it in the chat. So let's just run this one really quick so you can see the difference. Um, I'm gonna update my rehearsal URL. Actually, I think that one's right, but just in case, uh, Redis URL equals Redis, and then I've got, oops, wrong one, Redis URL equals, there's my Redis URL. All right, so let's run example four, and let's just see how this behavior changes now. So now, if I go to, the, to just the root, um, Oh, I've got an error. Let's see what my error is. Redis URL must specify one of the following schemes. Did I not type Redis colon slash slash? I forgot that. Let's run that again. So now when I go to my app, oh, look, I've got an error again. What's my error now? Um, Redis, URL, Redis colon slash slash. Did I not specify that? Nope. I've typed in the wrong, I typed in the wrong spot. That's my fault. Redis. There we go. I had a typo. Now it looks right. Let's try that now. Sorry for my typos. I still have typos. What am I doing wrong? Let's try this. Redis URL. Look at that. R-E-D-I-S. Colon slash slash. Oh, I've got the wrong value there. Uh, let me go back to one that I know works. Let's, I'm having trouble typing this all in the uh, browser, or sorry, in the terminal, so I'm just gonna type it here and get it right and then copy and paste it. Okay, so the Redis URL should be Redis colon slash slash, and then there's my Redis host. 
So that looks right. Let's copy all of that. Let's try pasting it here. That looks good. Hopefully this will work now. Yes, so I'm logged in as John and you can see it says visits one. And every time I load the homepage, you can see, maybe you can't see this, it's super small. Let's make that bigger. Every time I load the homepage, my visits is incrementing. And I can, you know, I can log out. And we can log in as someone else. This time we'll log in as Gabe. And I can refresh and my Gabe count goes up, right? So this is actually storing data in Redis now instead of in the, uh, in the local memory of my Python application. And that's cool, right? So like it only took me, as you saw, like a couple seconds to spin up a new Redis cluster and start using it from within uh, my, my you know, an EC2 instance effectively. And that's what I did here. By the way, uh, this, the, the new one that you saw me create is available now. They generally take a minute or two to come online, but I didn't want to keep you waiting. So hopefully uh, that at least showed you how easy it is to get a Redis server up and running with Elastic Cache as well as a nice way to end out the uh, end out the stream. Yeah, we got it. Sorry for my typos. That's my fault. Uh, looking to see if anybody else has uh, any final questions for me. Looks like not. Um, so perfect. Well, look, I need to wrap up. It's been an hour. My time is done. Thank you so much for joining me on this stream today. I really appreciate the interactivity we had in the chat. Uh, you all are great. Uh, just so you know, I believe this is the last episode of the show we're doing for this year because we've got some other uh, things going on between now and the end of the year. So uh, thanks for being loyal fans and for coming back. I really appreciate it. It's nice to see some familiar faces in here. Uh, and stay with us. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll uh, see you uh, on Twitch in the new year on this show or also on other ones. Uh, in the meantime, it's been fun. Uh, and I hope to see you online again. Thanks very much.